science and can be developed and engaged in military applications, warfare applications, um, bioweapons. Um. Neuroelectrophysiological techniques. It's been very, very important. Because what this allows us to do is essentially something akin to this, both literally and metaphorically, which is to essentially put the brain at our fingertips. No sci-fi here, folks, only facts. If we now take a look at the brain sciences as weaponizable, a real word, by the way, we can see that, in fact, the brain sciences are weaponizable across both dimensions. Utilize various types of brain assessment and access approaches for forms of biotracking getting what's called neurological signatures or brain signatures on key individuals that then may be representative of whole groups. This speeds back to what we discussed earlier, the neural narratives. If I understand how his brain works and how her brain works, and I'm able to do that on a broad enough scale, I can develop patterns, and as a result, I may be able to use that in ways that inform my intelligence. But this is a cat that's already out of the bag, and as I hope to demonstrate to you in a moment, this is being conducted on an international scale, and so it may be a little late to start thinking about we're never gonna use it like this and what happens if we do or we don't. I can utilize proteomics and other forms of biomarkers, and I can utilize neurocyber informatics. In other words, I can harness all of these forms of assessments to a big data approach that allow me to make both comparatives and normative indices not only within an individual, but between individuals, not only between individuals, but within and between groups on a variety of scales. The assessment neurotechnologies do a very good job in doing that with increasing sophistication. They're not used individually, they're used in a way that's called co-registered. I can use forms of neuroimaging, and these are diverse. They run the gamut from the older forms, such as things like computerized tomography and single photon emission tomography to the much newer forms that utilize a highly specific electromagnetic pulse signal, not only to be able to image certain brain areas, but also to image tracts, uh, communicating networks and nodes within the brain in a directional way, in, in rather rapid time. This is part of the incentive and underlying rationale and methods that were employed in a DARPA program called Narrative Networks that was led by a colleague of mine, Dr. William Kaysbeer. One of the things that makes this work, as I alluded to earlier, is the use of large-scale data banking and data utilization, what's referred to as big data. Not to belabor the point to excess or in extremis, understand it is used as a force multiplier. In other words, it takes the forces that are there and it multiplies both their capability and ultimately their value and utility as a consequence of being able to utilize large volume data banks, which then are able to engage, assimilate, synthesize, and pull down in real time individual cohort and populational data tiers, and in so doing, allow multiple tier integration, multimodal, multi-level, and then also allow real time access requirements that can be utilized in practice. In other words, so when we're looking at this idea of neuroscience and technology for national security, intelligence, and defense, I think the take home message here is that, yeah, we can access and affect, manipulating control, so to speak, neural systems to affect, alter, change, direct minds via brains and therefore the hearts in which those minds are embodied. A cybernetic organism that is an integration between a biological system and a technological system. The pioneering work in this field was done years ago, was Delgado's work with deep brain stimulation in a bowl. He utilized deep brain stimulating electrode coupled to a remote device, got into the bull arena, induced the bull to charge, pressed the button, and arrested the bull's forward motion. Stop, poised right before him. See what I can do through the use of cybernetic interactive systems. Moreover, we can also utilize something called Titan, which is tiered integrative tracking and access networks that utilize biologically implantable chips to then track key individuals in a variety of circumstances and then yoke these to known information about the way brains work to create narratives and behaviors. And essentially what this does is this adds to what's called human terrain teaming. In other words, I don't need to identify you by your uniform, by your clothes, but perhaps by certain anthropometric characteristics, and in this case, biological signatures. So the idea of indwelling biosensors that are able to then upload remotely, tele teletramized, tele telemetrized, see this is what happens when the coffee wears up, telemetrized information is quite real. Same type of thing can be used for other forms of information, not least of which is tracking and identification. The idea to then be able to take a key individual set of biological metrics and immediately in real time pull them into a large scale data analytic to say, this is who this person is, and this is where this person's been, and this is who this person's been interacting with, 
could be very, very useful. What types of kind of neural weapons can we engage and develop? Well, I provide them for you. I don't want to go down into specific granularity as to what each one of them do because I don't want to give you bad dreams. And you're not going to blame me if you wake up in a cold sweat scream in the middle of the night. But this is what we can do with these things. Again, let's think here about drugs and bugs. If we're looking at drugs, we're looking at what we call in-close pharmaceuticals. These are not weapons of mass destruction. These are weapons of mass disruption. What they can be used to do is create particular yet highly selective effects in individuals so that they can be delivered at very, very low doses, yet deliver a high amplification effect that's called a hormetic potential to be able to alter cognitions, emotions, and behaviors. How do you do that? Well, you can work on key operatives. In other words, this individual who's sitting before me may be a diplomat. They are now coming to interact with me. They may have a posture that does not necessarily align with mine. Can I alter their cognition? Can I alter their affiliation? Can I alter their emotionality? And in such a way, might I be able to alter their behavior? Yeah, I can. And if, in fact, this individual possesses political or charismatic capability, charm, charisma, leadership potential, to then stand before their people and say, this guy's my best buddy now. They might go, well, I'm following this guy. Or they might think he's stark raving mad and I've created social disruption within his political ranks. Target key brain sites and networks that have shown to be operative and functional in certain forms of our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. I can do that on a variety of levels, from individuals who are head of a small family or group, to the tribal, to the community, to the large-scale population. So we can utilize these things to be able to affect key operators and dynamic individuals who may charismatically, politically, or through other means of power be able to affect groups. It's a ripple effect. It is a ripple effect. Moreover, we can induce a number of neuromicrobiological agents to then incur something called high morbidity. These are not necessarily mortal agents. We can modify the existing palette of bacteria and viruses through the use of gene editing techniques, very viable. This has been some of my ongoing work with my colleague Diane Deulis at National Defense University. And what we can also do is recognize that there are existing microbiologicals that can be harnessed to then induce the effects. We can also engage certain chemicals that way. What we want here is a morbidity factor, not necessarily a mortality factor. I want to make people sick. And what I do here is the virus is not necessarily the bug. The virus is what I put over the internet. If I wanted to do something that's a little bit more proximate, I can utilize nanoparticulate matter. Now we can utilize nanoscience to create much better drugs to get them where they gotta go in the brain. I can create nanoscience and nanotechnology to be able to escort certain drugs across the proliferant barrier, which is the blood-brain barrier, and blood uh, cerebrospinal fluid barrier. So I get these things where they gotta go. But I can also utilize nanoparticulate matter in a very indiscriminate way. The idea here is that I can get something called high CNS aggregation material, that is essentially invisible to the naked eye and even to most scanners because it is so small that it selectively goes through most levels of filtered porosity. These are then inhaled either through the nasal mucosa or absorbed through the oral mucosa. They have high CNS affinity. They clump in the brain or in the vasculature and they create essentially what looks like a hemorrhagic diathesis, in other words, a hemorrhage predisposition or a clot predisposition in the brain. What I've, and one of the more successful approaches to doing this is through utilizations of genetic modification of these microbes so as to take those microbes that were relatively benign and make them somewhat more morbid in their profile, make them more virulent, or to allow them to be more capable over a longer period of time so that they can be used against various individuals and populations with a greater level of efficiency. And in fact, this is one of the things that has been entertained and examined to some extent by my colleagues in NATO and to those who are working on the worst use of neurobiological sciences to create populational disruption. Very, very worried about the potential for these nanoparticulate agents to be CNS aggregating agents to cause neural disruption, either as hemorrhagic and vascular disruptors or as actual neural network disruptors because they interfere with the network properties of various neural nodes and systems within the brain. Then I get to the area of devices. And this, in many ways, is gonna be less than definitive. The reason for this is, this is highly evolving and I think is limited only in certain cases by context of imagination. What are the devices? Well, I have them here for you here. They have neurosensory mobilizing agents. And to some extent, some of these have already been used. Things like high output sensory stimulators that can be administered from unmanned vehicles, drones, insect-borne, or larger scale, macro scale vehicles such as tanks, 
cars, etc. These are sensory mobilizing agents that use high electromagnetic pulse energy that may also utilize high levels of sound, high levels of, of light energy, and they disrupt neurological sensory function. Already being used, now they're being developed with higher specificity. Gizes and force, mul force multiplies my human intelligence, humant, my signal intelligence, sigint, and my communications intelligence, comment. When we're talking about a real form of a weapon, remember, this is a means of contending against another in each and all of these dimensions. Assess and predict their escalations to violence so that we may be able to intervene, perhaps mitigate those. Mitigate said aggression directly or indirectly. Incur certain burdens of morbidity that makes them less likely to engage in combative or violent activity. And in some cases, induce mortality. Gizes and false mul force multiplies my human intelligence, human, my signal intelligence, sigint, and my communications intelligence, comment.